This episode is presented by Avalair Ah. Hi, this is Tracy Curley, CFO at iSpecimen, and you are listening to the CFO Thought Leader Podcast. This is episode 905. The things that become important at any given moment do change over time, right? So building this a flexible machine where um, our main goals, as well as the instruments to measure them, are in everyone's hands, as well as the knowledge to translate it to their key priorities. Uh, that, I think, is the ultimate, you know, that I think that's the ultimate goal for most companies. And it's, it's, it's always a work in progress and something that's very top of mind as we think about organizational efficiency at this time in the market. Hi, it's Jack. On today's show, we speak with Sruthi Lanka, CFO of Public.com. Sruthi Lanka is clearly not the only CFO who began her professional career at Blue Chip Investment House, Goldman Sachs. However, she may be one of the only CFOs, if not the only one, who can trace her career roots to Goldman's technology engineering team. Back in 2009, as the economic downturn dispatched a daily dose of bad news, Lanka was tasked with separating Goldman's nervous bankers from their long-tenured messaging device of choice, the BlackBerry. While Apple's iPhone had already become a popular alternative to the BlackBerry inside multiple industries, bankers were known for clutching their BlackBerries, and Goldman was no exception. You'll hear that story and much more on today's episode. We'll begin after this. This episode is presented by Avalair Ah. That's the sound of not worrying about sales tax compliance. Because when you automate it with Avalara, you don't have to worry about collecting sales tax or tracking who and what is tax exempt. With Avalara, you don't even have to worry about new tax laws and regulations. Avalara does it for you. If your business sells internationally, Avalara has you covered with cross-border tax compliance solutions. And when it comes time to file tax returns, Avalara automatically takes care of that too giving you one less thing to worry about. Avalara has managed billions of sales for small, mid-size, and enterprise businesses and seamlessly works with your current sales, e-commerce, and accounting platforms. Take the worry out of tax compliance with Avalara. Ah. Learn more at avalara.com. That's A-V-A-L-A-R-A dot com. Hello, we're speaking with Sruthi Lanka, CFO of Public.com. Sruthi, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Excited to be here. So, Sruthi, as you probably know, we always begin by asking our CFO guests to look back for us. And we want to know what were the experiences they feel prepared them to become a finance leader. When you look back, what comes to mind? Yeah, as I, you know, in preparing for this podcast, as I thought about this, I feel like it's totally true that the dots connect backward. Yeah. Uh, And I've often described myself as the accidental CFO. Uh, I, if you asked me even, you know, 15 years ago, I would not be expecting to sit in the seat. And that's because I started out as an engineer. I was an engineer at Goldman Sachs, actually working on. Um, something that sounds so ancient now, replacing the BlackBerry with iPhones, which was revolutionary in banks at the time. And while I was working on that, yeah, I really was immersed in my work, enjoyed it greatly. There were two things that shook my world and kind of moved me closer to finance. One was the Great Recession. I think, you know, very few people saw it coming, but definitely not me as an engineer uh, at Goldman and it I, you know, drove me to understand how such a thing could come to be. And equally, at the same time, I actually had a personal event. My parents 
super smart engineers, some of the sharpest actually uh, electronics engineers I've met, had no idea what to do with their money and lost half their savings through a series of bad trades. And so both of these really like shook my world and made me want to understand how finance worked. And that curiosity ultimately led me down this path. Um, and I think that systems in- engineering mindset really has served me in future roles and ultimately led me to a, a place where I solve exactly this, right? Like how do you get smart people to invest better at public.com? Uh, so I'd say that's, that was one major kind of event. Um, the second was when I was an investment banker at Royal Bank of Canada. Uh, you know, it, it's a super fun job, honestly, to be advising clients on the most pivotal moments of a company's uh, trajectory, right? So there was this one client in Dallas that I was working with. Uh, you know, we're working on the sale. The CEO had built this company uh, from scratch. He was 30 years into this journey, and he was just about to sell it to a larger entity. I worked closely alongside the team for, gosh, months. It's got to have been, you know, six to nine months. I felt such a part of the team, and there were so many, you know, fundamental questions like, is this a good cultural fit? What happens to our employees after acquisition? And I, was, I felt like I was part of all of these major decisions, right? But then the transaction closed and I was at the door because I was just the advisor as the investment banker. And that experience of, you know, not knowing what happened after these this months of work really made me realize that I needed to bring my skills in-house. I really wanted to do to wanted to build a company versus just advise others, right? Um, and the last, I think, which combines this you know, finance experience uh, with my earlier engineering experience was at my last company, Moneyline, which I joined uh, as Series A and ultimately ended up leaving right before they went public via SPAC. I was there for the entire journey, right? Ups and downs, the the, the very small startup to much more scaled company. And along the way, I was, you know, querying an internal database. I still had some of my engineering skills. And so I was querying an internal database to get some data for better forecasting within the business. And I got told off by our engineering leader to not touch anything that would affect our customer's experience. Legitimately, that was, you know, he should have told me off for it. But I needed the data. Right, and I needed this information to make better finance decisions, so I decided to build a, the data warehouse myself, and you know I had my team do it. So this experience of being needing access to something without you know um, wanting to affect our customers led to uh, me spinning up a, a data team with it adjacent to my finance team, which ultimately now is honestly you know pretty standard practice. But in those days, it was the early days of Snowflake; it was not so common. Um, so I think that marriage of data and finance, which I'm sure I'll talk a little bit more about, um, was was really the third kind of pivotal thing. So as I look back, I think a systems focus from my early days at Goldman, really wanting to you know build teams from ground up from from my time in investment banking, and then marrying data and finance closely, I would say, um, are the three biggest things that you know, come to mind. Great. N- nice overview for us. Thank you. I-, I have to say, interesting lines of sight you must have enjoyed at uh, Goldman as a tech analyst. Correct me if I'm wrong. You were there roughly 2009 to, to 2012. That was when the the iPhone showed up and they're adopting yeah. it and you're you know, in charge of making sure it's a good fit for, for the workforce there and how, how is this going to work exactly? Um, just an unusual tour of duty inside Goldman and uh, what an opportunity to observe the behaviors and the priorities of uh, the executives. And of course, yeah. that's also the, the financial crisis is going down. <laughs> yeah, it was an interesting time because, you know, the, there was such doom and gloom um, on the finance side, but there was such excitement on the technology side. Right. This was when the iPhone came out and we found that all of our employees, including myself, were, you know, living on the iPhone. And then we had to carry this clunky object along, which was the BlackBerry, uh, which didn't even work as well. And so there was such a clamor within the company to uh, um, to find a better solution. But most banks were not even, you know, 
entertaining it because the BlackBerry was locked down. It was, you know, ironclad. And at the time, iPhones were not. So I was a part of, of a four-person team at, at Goldman. That's a very small team, as you could imagine. But it was kind of a startup within the company um, exploring whether we could move to the iPhone and we, if we could do it securely. So the first thing we did was build um, um, an ironclad. Things that actually are come out of the box today on the iPhone did not exist. So it was a secure connection all the way between um, our servers and uh, the end device. And it was built essentially in, um, in a language pretty close to C++. So it, it was definitely the early days and a very interesting experience, but speaks to um, the leadership team there being interested in taking on something that seemed honestly impossible at a time to do securely. You know, at the same time, uh, it gave you uh, an eye full of um, the executives. What I'm thinking is, is that, and I think you went to business school after Goldman. Is that, is that right? And you kind yes. of, do you, so is there a sort of an evolution happening there that, you know, you, you walk into Goldman an engineer and come out the other side thinking finance, I can do this. I, I uh, yeah. you've gotten a sense of the, the executives who were surrounding you. What would you tell us? Yeah. Um, look, I think that going through that experience in Goldman, I, you know, I learned a lot uh, tech, technically. I knew what I was doing. I felt much more confident as an engineer. But I realized that, you know, the decisions that the people made around me, honestly, I didn't always fully understand. And so, like I said in my first uh, kind of response, this curiosity is ultimately what drove me towards, yeah, I want to see how the other side of the table thinks. Like, you know, why did you make the decisions that you made, which led to you know, various events, right? That that piece of the puzzle, understanding the financial acumen, fi the decision making, the you know desi desire to invest or not, um, that part was completely missing to me as an engineer, right? For example, this was a very exciting project that you know we were working on, but given the times, we were losing people left, right, and center. If you remember 2009 to 2012, it was a rough time on Wall Street, right? Um, and to me, working on this nascent technology, which was so promising, it felt like you needed to invest, put more resources in it. But obviously, the decisions being made higher up, uh, you know, went, went the other way because all banks were downsizing. And so the desire to understand what was driving some of these bigger decisions is ultimately what led me to business school, right? I felt, I felt like I needed the business acumen um, to uh, count, to round out my technical acumen. That's what led me to business school and ultimately investment banking because I think it's the ultimate seat of looking at a company outside in looking at what's working, what's not, and thinking about a business model from ground up. Uh, as you, you went into uh, investment banking, did you think you would be there long or was it, it, was it just going to be a swipe on your sleeve and then you were going to once more move on? Um, give us a sense of your uh, mindset. Yeah, going into it, I don't know that I had a clear plan about, that I wanted to you know get out of it soon, but I think it came to me as I worked through it, right? What was extremely exciting was that, honestly, I was relatively young, sitting across from extremely seasoned CEOs and CFOs and helping them make major decisions. That you know, taught me everything about highly strategic thinking, right? Uh, and so that was incredibly powerful and, and empowering in that moment. But on the other side, um, we were only providing the advice and the CEOs could easily turn us down. So there was, I, rem I clearly remember an example where I worked on this, you know, um, weeks long analysis. It seemed like a no brainer merger of equals within the sector that I was covering. We had a very, very deep, um, you know, strategic rationale plus the numbers behind it and you know, all the modeling and everything. And, uh, I was extremely proud of this product. I thought it was the, one of the best pitch decks I had ever worked on. And we walked into the CFO's office, and and uh, and they were they appreciated the conversation. It was healthy, but they just felt like it was something that you know it was not a strategic priority for them. They just didn't want to distract the company from all the other things they were doing. Uh, 
And that is not the lens you get when you're uh, an investment banker, right? So I remember feeling also just disappointed after the weeks of work and then realizing that I didn't have the full picture. And again, the curiosity to get the full picture, I think, ultimately led, led me in-house. When you do uh, leave investment banking, what, what is it that you're looking for? <laughs> so I left investment banking for what I sometimes call my eat, pray, love moment. <laughs> uh, I had no clear uh, path ahead of me. I actually left without a job. Um, and I took six months off. And uh, I honestly, if you can afford it, if one can afford it, I highly recommend this, especially as you're thinking about um, you know, if there are a few paths ahead of you. So, I, and I was lucky to get married during that time. It was, it was a time of, it was an exciting time personally. But during that time, I thought fundamentally about what drove me and what I found most exciting in the times that I had worked before, right? At Goldman, when I felt like I was on the verge of something big that no one else was looking at, that was extremely exciting. And at, um, in investment banking at Royal Bank of Canada, when I felt like I was able to drive thinking, that you know, uh, change the, the mind of the CEO or the CFO we were sitting across from with the strength of my analysis, that was really empowering to me. And so I wanted to bring those two things together and, and I, I don't know that I was thinking, I want to go be CFO for a startup, but I just wanted to do this, you know, at a company. And that's what led me to be really the first uh, finance hire and the right-hand person of the CFO at my next job, which was at Moneyline uh, at the early stage startup. We want to ask you about public.com, but just in regards to uh, stepping into the CFO office, we're wondering whether... Uh, you used your network. Was there uh, perhaps a recruiter involved? What would you tell us? So um, uh, in startups in general, I discovered through my network, but at public.com, I was approached by a recruiter. We then found out that we had people in common. Startups said to be a small space. Um, but yes, this was, a, this was through a recruiter. Okay. So we might have a few more uh, career-related questions a little later for you. But right now, let's find out about public.com. Tell us about this company. What does it do? What are its offerings today? Yeah. Public.com is an investment platform where you can trade stocks, treasuries, which you cannot do easily it, at all outside of public, um, crypto, as well as alternative assets. You can buy a piece of a Banksy painting on public. And so we bring together assets that no one else does uh, in one easy to use app. Uh, but the other thing that really sets us apart is the context that we build from the moment you start using the app. So not only do we have a large community where you can exchange ideas, learn about dollar cost averaging and some finance fundamentals, um, but we offer uh, custom media. So we have a, a show series called Public Life where experts in the industry talk about topics such as renewables or uh, what's driving volatility in the markets. And so the combination of uh, custom alerts as well as you know as well as product features that build context around the stocks that you own with the media that we produce as well as really a distinguished business model for example we don't accept pfof we're one of the few platforms uh, that don't take payment for order flow which is the equivalent of you know facebook and google uh, selling your data for advertiser money, right? We don't do that. Many of our competitors do. Um, these are the things that really set us apart from some of our competition. Now, is there like a, who who would be a typical user of public.com? And I'm sure there's, there's a variety of different users, but no, there's got to be a sweet spot. Uh, you know, someone who's, who's busy, who's rather well off. Uh, can you characterize who, who's yeah. using this platform? I think public is best suited for, well, one, I feel like we serve a spectrum, as you said, right? I think it, it, it should be said, particularly with our community features, we serve, we serve a new investor extremely well. But really the one that you know, finds the most resonance with our platform is someone who is um, you know, what's typically known as Henry's, right? High earners, but not rich yet. So building wealth along the way, uh, you know, they're making money, they have some savings, 
they want to invest it. Where do I put that money? There, that question is not easily answered for most people, unless you're over a million dollars or $2 million in assets, no bank or private wealth advisor really speaks to you, right? Um, and so as you're building wealth along the way, uh, public.com's contextual information plus custom data and metrics um, seems to find a lot of resonance. Now, can you give us uh, perhaps a, an abbreviated history of public.com's capital structure? Yeah, we have a very simple, uh, public has raised over 300 million. This is publicly available information, <laughs> no pun intended, um, of, ca- of equity capital. Uh, and we are a startup, you know, we're Series D startup. We raised our last round in February 2021. Um, so it's how, yeah, it, it Within the world of startups, it's a, you know it's a pretty simple cap structure, pretty similar to some of our competitors. You mentioned that uh, capital raise that would have happened, I think, shortly after your arrival there. Yeah, one would imagine. But can you can you tell us? Turn back the clock. You arrive in December 2020, <clears throat> and what are your priorities upon your arrival? Really, I guess you're raising money. Uh, but what else would you share with us? Is there certain parts of the finance team that had to be put into place, or what, what are you up to? Yeah, so public is uh, is a, a very young company, honestly, for the level of uh, uh, of momentum that it had at the time that I joined. So it had only been started, uh, launched publicly as in its current form in September 2019. So I had I joined the company only a year later. So many of the finance functions were still pretty nascent. I walked in the mm-hmm. door with really only a part-time team um, and not as much information in data and infrastructure as I talked about it. So as I looked around, I realized that one of the first things I had to do was bring that team in-house. I can, t- I can talk ad nauseum about why it's important to have in-house accounting teams, particularly in, at periods of scaling. Um, but my first hire actually was on the data warehouse side. And this goes back a little bit to closely marrying finance and data teams. I think this may be you know, surprising for some of your listeners, uh, but I, the first thing I did, because it's extremely important for the data warehouse to you know, keep track of engineering evolution so that you're not you know, catching up from behind, my first hire was to build out the data warehouse. The second was to in-house the accounting functions, uh, an awesome woman who I brought from a previous company. Um, and the third was the strategic finance, right? And I think that is the right kind of order for dominoes to fall if you are building a finance team pretty much from scratch. Uh, you need the house to be in order, so you need your infrastructure on the analytics and accounting side to be in order, and then you need a strong strategic finance person to marry those two things together and help drive decisions around the direction of the business. Well, you shared something that I think uh, is interesting and and is part of the way you think. Again, what you just shared about data warehousing being the first part of the house you needed to get in order or as you saw it. Uh, There had to be a lot of reasons why you might have wanted to address accounting first. But this is emphasizing the nature of the business and, and who you are, too, with your background. You mentioned the data warehousing component. Did you have to go out and find this expertise or did you work walk in lockstep with your, your IT folks or how did, how did that happen? Oh, yeah. It's an extremely close partnership, right? And even the interview process reflected that, you know, there were engineering stakeholders as well as business stakeholders in, in, in the interview process to hire our data lead. But um, the short of it is... It's extremely important for finance and accounting and really the finance leaders of today to have an extremely good grip on where the business is today operationally as much as it is important to know where it is financially, right? Um, And done right, you get most, if not exactly accurate information, you know, highly directional information from your data warehouse on how your business is. from day to day. So think about it as a daily close versus the monthly close that the accounting team does, 
right? And so really, I think this is most finance people dream, right? Is to get to a daily close, is to know exactly how the business is doing every day so that you can make a better decision tomorrow. The closest way to approximate that is to have a strong data warehouse that has most of the pieces that are important uh, to make strategic decisions. And, and so that's why I think that domino was the first to fall. You said, uh, it, as you prioritize, you mentioned strategic finance follows the accounting component um, into your world. Um, and by that, I'm assuming, okay, uh, she has a, she may have an FP&A uh, wing person, but uh, maybe not. Or, or is there a FP&A higher in your future? Or how would you characterize your, your FP&A? Yeah, resource? I would say, <laughs> yep. Uh, it's a good question. At a current scale, I would say strategic finance and fe and are two hats that the same team wears. They do become distinct over time and fe and becomes more operational. But especially in the earlier stages of a business where you have more zero to one products, you don't really know what assumptions need to go in, in your model, right? You need a team that can pivot quickly based on the learnings that are coming in every day. And I find that that sits well within strategic finance. So um, right now that team wears both hats, but I see that become distinct over time. All right. So uh, we like to ask you about your lines of sight into the organization, wondering uh, what you're paying attention to in terms of the metrics. We would have to believe it's your customer behaviors, your your activities, um, you know, recurring revenue from customers. What would you tell us? Yeah, I think what makes being a startup leader fun is that in addition to all of the traditional metrics, right? You care about revenues, you care about obviously the bottom line, you care about, you know, the equivalent of bookings for the consumer space. Um, and all of these metrics are absolutely very important, which are more, I would say, period metrics. But the second thing that uh, is is really tells you how the business is going to perform our cohort metrics, right? So basically a user that comes in in January, um, how are they be- performing month three down, right, in April? And how does that compare to a user that came in in December and how they were doing in March versus April? So month three down from December, right? Um, and so this view of looking at all users and their behaviors, month zero versus month one versus month two, this is quite unique to startups. Uh, as you scale, is particularly finance teams become more and more focused on just what is happening in January versus February. They're not thinking what is happening in the first month versus the second month. And so going seamlessly between these two views, I think, is extremely important for a startup leader. So in addition to some of the period metrics that you mentioned, which for us you know, are annualized revenues, uh, and obviously cash metrics is where a startup, you know, uh, cash balances, how does that trend over time? Um, it's also cohort metrics, like average revenue per user in a, in a period, um, payback periods, lifetime values, churn metrics, cohorted. Um, so those are the metrics I pay very close attention to. You know, it would be interesting to hear your thoughts on AI. We've been chatting with finance leaders about chat GPT since the start of the year. Um, conversations that maybe hadn't taken place every everywhere have now taken place everywhere. I mean, the conversation in the strategy table is, is uh, what does this mean for us? What does this mean for our business, our users, our customers? Is there something that we need to uh, be investigating that might change our offering in some some way. How is it going to impact your world? What are, you know? What are the conversations like there? Yeah, it's funny. It's it's like I teed up this conversation because we just launched Public Alpha, which is a Chat GPT driven assistant to you know get context around investing decisions. Soon, you're going to be able to swipe down in the app and uh, ask a question of Alpha about whatever stock you're looking at, maybe uh, some history, maybe some price data, maybe some multiples. Um, And so this is most definitely coming uh, to the investment space uh, and we're launching ours as an investing co-pilot. But I also think it touches every single team within the business. Uh, uh, We we have a goal of, uh, and this, you know, may be different from, 
for many of my competitors. If I never hire an, another accountant, I'm fine with it. We're extremely focused now on automating every single team thing that our accounting does um, through Chad GPT, right? Uh, so one obvious area is accruals. You feed in a contract and you say, what do I have to accrue? Today, that, that's manual work. There is someone on the team who's going through this contract, looking, you know, making sure they don't miss something, going back, double checking, talking to legal, talking to operations. What Chat GPT is very good at is reading contracts. Um, and so if, if it can spit out accruals, that's something we're working through. Uh, so I think we're investing heavily in automation and machine learning driven automation. And I think it's absolutely going to touch the finance space, but also definitely the investing space. So many businesses, I think, are experiencing what you're you're relating. At the same time, curious, uh, I mean, a year ago, uh, was there a, a moment in the last 12 months? And again, we know chat GPT only began making headlines the end of last year. But when did you sort of have your aha moment? As it, uh, for less of a better way of expressing it, uh, as it relates to chat GPT, is there something that suddenly conversation was like, do you know that we could use it in this fashion or here's how it is? And you, you described that new product offering. Does that go back 24 months? I, I don't know. Yeah, no, we, uh, you know, we discovered chat GPT like, uh, like uh, alongside others. But what I think is one of the secret weapons at public is our ability to deliver products extremely quickly. You know, we did this with treasuries, right? Uh, you know, we were, there was a time in the markets not too long ago, if you look at 2021 and 2022, people were trading much more speculative names and assets, and that's what people were interested in. And then the Fed raised interest rates very quickly. Inflation went up. People needed to put money in their pockets. They were focused on yield. And so we, we were the first to launch treasuries, and you can buy treasuries in the public app in two clicks uh, and the only real alternative is treasury direct which is a much more clunky website right um, and so we were able to launch extremely quickly and we did the same here with chat gpt so it's awesome to be part of a team that can um, launch quickly the way you explain it, it i would say that as finance leader you're a contributor to that mindset within the culture um i and um, i'm not i don't think you emulated upon your arrival, you sort of arrived with that mindset of thinking forward. Yeah, I think it's a very core uh, part of the public principles is to embrace urgency. And this is this is one of our listed principles as well. And it's, it's really, uh, you know, and um, what we called organized speeding, which is Move as fast as you possibly can, but take all of the relevant stakeholders along, right? And so I think those two principles working in conjunction really tell you the kind of talent that we like to attract. Um, it's people who take massive ownership over their work, uh, but also no one needs to get done and go after it uh, and, and can be trusted to be the DRI on that uh, particular task, the directly responsible individual. Um, they keep they take everyone else along as needed, organize speeding, um, but they embrace urgency and get the job done. Wow, oh, great. Thank you for that. Um, can I jump to our finance strategic moment question? And again, this is where we just look for one moment of insight that you'd like to share with us that reveals how finance plays a strategic role in business. What comes to mind when we ask for a finance strategic moment? Yeah. I have touched on this a little bit. Uh, you know, it touches both data and finance as well as, you know, cohort versus periods. Uh, this was in the early days of Moneyline and uh, we were, you know, we were going through a fundraise and I was also setting internal targets for the company. And what I was finding was I was, you know, forecasting the business like many others do, you know, taking like, January and saying, okay, February is e either going to be an increase or decrease. How much are we spending? Let's compare it to the previous month, compare it to the previous month and forecast accordingly. Not, uh, not about forecasting method and one that's actually extremely common, right? Uh, just essentially looking at the months and building on patterns that were visible to me. But I found that I was just missing the mark really just not forecasting well. I was not doing my job well. Um, and as I thought fundamentally about what I was getting wrong, I realized 
you know, none of the targets that I was giving were useful to the product teams, to the teams internally. And they were managing the business completely differently. They were looking at a set of users that came in last week and said, okay, what are they doing the following week and the one after? And this is, and really starting from how is the business being run and how is that driving output uh, was the, you know, the penny drop moment for me. And that's when I really discovered the power of cohorts, right, which I talked about a little bit. I sat down with a product team and said, just tell me how, you know, how you are thinking about the business. And so we started from looking at users and their behavior over time versus worrying about which time period in the year we were in, you know, March versus April. And then I zoomed that back out because you don't quite need daily, weekly detail in the model. I picked up monthly cohorts for our users and looked at their behaviors over time. And lo and behold, I found that it was a much better predictor um, of our revenues, much better predictor of financial performance. And so really changing our forecasting methodology entirely on its head um, to start with the customer was, um, was a major unlock for me and one that I use till date. From episode 740, this is CFO Roy Simmons of GE Lighting, a savant company. The pivot that we went through in 2019 in preparation to join up with Savant was to establish ourselves in a, I'll call it a standalone middle market finance organization, where we had to retool and redefine treasury. We had to retool and redefine controllership and tax. We needed to hire talent into the business so that we didn't have to survive with General Electric Company transition service agreements, the nemesis of many CFOs in post-divestiture worlds. And so that year that we spent prior to the actual consummation of the sale was around building that, I'll call it standalone. We're going to jump to what I refer to as our mentoring round now, which is where we ask you some informal or uh, questions that are intended to inspire and inform future finance leaders. We want you to look back and think about the first time you stepped into a CFO role and uh, who you were, what you knew, what you didn't. If you could go back in time and give yourself some advice that first 30 days, what would it have been? Yeah. Oh, I'm sure you you know you've heard this on your podcast before, and I heard some great episodes. Um, but it was really, honestly, would have been to trust myself. Like, for example, that one of those first decisions was to focus on on data versus paradoxically finance, which is what you know, which was really the bulk of my title. Um, but it ended up being the right stepping stone for the business at the time. And so I think trust yourself when you, uh, you uh, and that I think instinct was built on the years of dealing closely with both, you know, engineering teams, product teams, startups, as well as larger companies. And so I think trusting that instinct would have been important at the time. Honestly, I wasn't sure if it was the right thing to do. Um, the, the second would be finding uh, the right mentor said. So I, uh, you know, I'm co-founder of this uh, CFO group called F Suite, uh, a founding member rather. And uh, we, it's, a, it's an amazing peer group and community for particularly CFOs of private companies to interact um, and learn from each other. Finding the right, and that peer group didn't really exist when I first started, and it would have been game changing, honestly, if I had it. So I think finding the right, um, you know, peer mentors is key. And the last piece of the puzzle, I think, is is having mentors at different stages. So I'm very lucky to count some later stage mentors, public company mentors among my roster. Uh, and I think it's really important for me to set sights on where I, I the skills I need to build. Um, the road that's ahead of me and the way I 
keep sight of that is having more experienced mentors at with companies at different stages. Well, thank you for that. Uh, we always like to ask our guests to reflect a little bit on the personal side of things. We're wondering if you have a personal habit or some, you know, a routine that you're known for, something that might set you apart from others. Um, anything come to mind? Again, might be something a family member would point out and say she she's always done that <laughs> that way. <Yeah>. Not sure. <laughs> Yeah, you know, this is a good one. I think some um, some of it is, like, is, I think, fairly common, but still extraordinarily important. I read a lot. I think that's, you know, I consume a lot of information, whether it's through podcasts or audiobooks or reading. But really, I think the thing that I, it's, it's more a thing I don't do versus do. I don't uh, check my email before the 2 p.m. unless, you know, I look at it fleetingly, but I don't sit down and work on my email first thing in the morning. Uh, I save my like, creative hours, my early morning hours for real problem solving, things I need to work on, long form writing, etc. And I think those are just really important hours. I save my email for 2 p.m. when I'm flagging. Um, and so I think that may be one thing that others point out. That's a, that's a great one, actually. I haven't heard that one before. It mm-hmm. makes sense. Thank you for that. Wondering if there's a, a book that's influenced your thinking or maybe something you've escaped with. Any Anything as a book selection you'd recommend? Uh, I read uh, a healthy amount of fiction as well as nonfiction. Uh, on business books, man, I really, really loved Shoe Dog, um, Phil Knight. I'm sure you've probably got that recommendation before or read it yourself (laughs) as really a fantastic book of perseverance in the face of all odds and I just love the parallels to startup life uh there's a number of others but you know that one now stands out um that's a favorite one of uh finance folks I'm not sure I I know that he came out of Price Waterhouse so there's this accounting sort of uh, mindset that I think people enjoy, but that's not your background. And it, it's, yeah. it is an entrepreneurial book though, as we well know, uh, Nike in the early days was on, on delicate footing. Uh, so. uh, I, I think it's, I think it's the, the entrepreneurial nature of it. The certainly the storytelling, very powerful storytelling, uh, but more the, uh, you know, he was faced against uh, all kinds of boards, uh, larger incumbents stepping on his space as well as just, you know, supply chain issues, macro issues, all of those resonate, not supply chain because we're obviously a digital brokerage, but there are macro issues that are outside of our controls, right? The markets. Um, and so surmounting all odds is, is a theme that's, um, that's just, I think, universal. So uh, we're up to our final question where we ask you to look forward finally, and we're wondering what your priorities are for the next 12 months as CFO of public.com for the next 12 months. What would those be? Yeah, I think as I look ahead, it is further deepening some of what we talked about, right? The metrics that you know we consider our North Star, uh, everyone in our company should live and breathe. Um, and have the tools to translate into their day-to-day. Now, the infrastructure exists. We have our data infrastructure like we talked about. We have our goals like we talked about. But the things that become important at any given moment do change over time, right? So building this a flexible machine where um, our main goals as well as the instruments to measure them are in everyone's hands as well as the knowledge to translate it to their key priorities. Uh, that I think is the ultimate, you know, that I think that's the ultimate goal for most companies. And it's, it's, it's always a work in progress and something that's very top of mind as we think about organizational efficiency at this time in the market. Shruti Lanka, thank you for joining us on CFO Thought Leader. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Hello, Thought Leader listeners. As you have perhaps already heard or even seen, we're now featuring the career lessons and moments of strategic insight shared by our CFO guests as Thought Leader videos. You can now find these videos on our blog at cfothoughtleader.com 
and of course our newsletters, but also on LinkedIn. If you haven't already, please go ahead and follow our CFO Thought Leader LinkedIn company page, and you'll be certain not to miss a single Thought Leader video debut. CFO Thought Leader, the number one thought leadership platform exclusively for and by CFOs. As always, thank you for listening.